the, the paradoxical thing here, and it's sort of echoed, uh, this is why I like these two stories back to back, is like, if you give people what they want, then the first thing they're going to do is try to get beyond it. And Dostoevsky says the same thing in Notes from Underground. He says, if you gave people everything they wanted, pure utopia, so he says, so that they're, they're sitting in a pool of bliss with nothing but bubbles of happiness coming up from the surface, and all they have to do is eat cake and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. Dostoevsky's observation is, the first thing that people would do is find something to smash that with, just so that something interesting and perverse could happen. It's like, well, yes, we're, we're creatures that are designed to encounter the unknown. We want to keep moving beyond what we have, even if we have what we have is what we want. And maybe that's partly because we're oriented towards the future. We think, well, this is great, but it's not good enough. It's great, but it's not good enough. There's always something more that drives us forward. Well, so that's what happens with the Buddha. He gets curious. He sees the walls. He thinks, well, there's walls. There's probably something outside of those walls. So then he goes to his father. And he says, I'm, I want to go outside. What's outside? And his father says, no, nah, you don't want to go outside. And Buddha says, yeah, well, I really do want to go outside. And his father knows that unless he lets him go outside, he's going to climb over the walls. And so the father decides he's going to let him go outside, but he's going to fix everything out there first. So he goes outside. It's like the Chinese preparing for the Olympics, you know, when they sprayed the grass with, with, uh, with green paint, got rid of all the homeless people. It's the same thing. So he goes outside the city and he tells everyone, all right, old people, sick people, dying people, hit the road. <laughs> we don't want to see you for a while. Clean all this out. We want the attractive people around the sides of the roads, like waving palm fronds and all of that. And so when my son comes out, he's going to see nothing but what's good. And so he gets that all arranged and he lets his son go outside. Now, his son goes outside in this little chariot thing and he has a, uh, someone with him. Now, unbeknownst to his father, that person that's with him is an emissary of the gods. And so in a perverse way, he plays the same role as the serpent in the story of, of, of Adam and Eve. And the gods have already arranged so that the father's uh, care is going to be insufficient. And it's the snake in the garden idea. It's like no matter how much care you take to make things perfect, some of, the, some of what, what you're excluding is going to come back in. So anyways, Buddha goes outside and, and he's in his chariot and preparations were made to gild his chosen route, to cover the adventurer's path with flowers and to display for his admiration and preoccupation the fairest women of the kingdom. The prince set out with full retinue in the shielded comfort of a chaperone chariot and delighted in the panorama previously prepared for him. The gods, however, decided to disrupt these most carefully laid plans and sent an aged man to hobble in full view alongside the road. The prince's fascinated gaze fell upon the ancient interloper. Compelled by curiosity, he asked his attendant, what is that creature stumbling, shabby, bent, and broken beside my retinue? And the attendant answered, That is a man, like other men, who was born an infant, became a child, a youth, a husband, a father, a father of fathers. He has become old, subject to destruction of his beauty, his will, and the possibilities of life. Like other men, you say, hesitantly inquired the prince. That means this will happen to me? And the attendant answered, inevitably, with the passage of time. Well, that's the end of that party. The world collapses in on Buddha and bang, he hightails it home. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's what children do, roughly speaking, is they're around their mother. They're, they've got security there. They go out into the unknown. They encounter something that's just a little bit too much for them. Bang, they come home. They get all patted back into shape and hugged and taken care of. Hugging children and patting them is actually analgesic. It actually reduces pain. Unsurprisingly, that's what you do with someone who's grieving, right? So you hug them because grief is pain. So, so they, you know, you pat them, they get rid of their pain, they get rid of their anxiety, you calm them down. And what happens? Well, the next day they want to go out again. Well, that's exactly what happens to the Buddha. So he's all shorted out by his encounter with death, which is very little different than what happens to Adam and Eve, runs back, recovers for six months. He has post-traumatic stress disorder. He runs home and he recovers for six months, right? In time, his anxiety lessened, his curiosity grew, and he ventured outside again. This time, the gods sent a sick man into view. This creature, he asked his attendant, shaking and palsied, horribly afflicted, unbearable to behold, a source of pity and contempt. What is he? And the attendant answered, that's a man like other men. 
who was born whole, but who became ill and sick, unable to cope, a burden to himself and others, suffering and incurable. Like other men you say, inquired the prince, this could happen to me. And the attendant answers, no man is exempt from the ravages of disease. Once again, the world collapsed and Gautama returned to his home. But the delights of his previous life were ashes in his mouth and he ventured forth a third time. The gods in their mercy sent him a dead man in funeral procession. This creature, he asked his attendant, laying so still, appearing so fearsome, surrounded by grief and by sorrow, lost and forlorn, what is he? And the attendant answered, that is a man, like other men, born of woman, beloved and hated, who was once you, who once was you and now is the earth. Like other men, you say, inquired the prince, then this could happen to me? This is your end, said the attendant, and the end of all men. Well, that's the end of childhood, right? There's no going back after that. It's like Pinocchio goes back. There's no one home anymore. It's, there's nothing that your father can do to protect you from knowledge of death. There's no returning to the childhood unconsciousness because you're, you now know and there's no going backwards.